So uh, sometimes we're not fully aware uh, how much our life is speaking to people. But your life preaches, uh, whether you know it or not. Uh, one person said it like this. He said, what you do speaks so loudly that I can't hear what you're saying, right? That, that, that actions are louder than words. And, and so that's uh, certainly true and maybe something we need increasing awareness of. Actually, a little book that really impacted me a number of years ago by a guy named Parker Palmer was uh, Let Your Life Speak. And he just says, hey, your whole life is calling, is vocation, it's calling. And, and we can learn how to let our lives uh, tell a story because your life is telling a story right now. It, and, and so if we're aware of that, we can be conscious of it and, and we can use that in a direction. Um, there's actually a, a fairly famous quote. Uh, some people attribute it to St. Francis of Assisi. It says this, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. <laughs> it's kind of creative, hey? And, and, and that's an awesome quote. It would be even more awesome if it was true. It's only partly true. Okay, um, it, it, it makes a great point that our actions are preaching and they, uh, they're preaching whether we know it or not. But the truth is actually also that it, it's not if necessary use words, it is necessary that we add words to our actions uh, to, to let them speak. And so uh, we've been learning over the last couple of weeks as uh, 1 Peter turns a corner, we're in the middle of 1 Peter, and as it turns a corner, we've been learning that each one of us has a special calling. In fact, the way the Bible says it is it says, you are holy priests. And you think, wow, what does that mean? Um, we call it actually the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers, that every follower of Jesus is a holy priest. Or maybe I could say it a different way, a more, uh, term that you might be more familiar with. If you are a follower of Jesus, whether you're six years old or 96 years old, uh, whether you're, you know, uh, male or female, whatever, you are a man of God or a woman of God. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are filled with the Spirit of God, you are called of God, uh, you're God's instrument in this world. Uh, and I think sometimes that's hard for us to really grasp how much uh, that is meant to challenge us. I have a friend years ago who everybody he used to come up to, he would say, hey, man of God, hey, woman of God. You know, that's how he would greet you. Hey, woman of God, hey, man of God. And, and you know, it, it irritated me a little bit, I'll be honest. Um, partly, I just thought it sounded corny. But partly, uh, partly I, I was like, well, what if they're not living like a man of God or a woman of God? Or, what, you know, what if they're, and, and maybe shouldn't they be more humble than that? And shouldn't they sort of see themselves, you know, um, maybe as the, the mess that we all are, we need Jesus and that kind of thing. But as I reflected on it more, um, you know, that little term, man of God, it actually comes from Paul speaking to Timothy. And he says, but you, man of God, you know, do such and such. And there's something about being called higher, all right? I actually have a friend right now who's uh, looking at moving towards ordination, being ordained as a, as a, a leader, you know, and that, that would make you a reverend. Ooh, right? If you're ordained, you're reverend. And as I've been talking to this friend about that, he looks at me like, whoa, are you sure? Right? Like, man, people start calling me reverend. You know, if I'm ordained, that's, that's a little scary. And it ought to be. It ought to sort of make us go, <gasps> and here's, here's what the Bible does. In the Old Testament, there's men of God, women of God. There's these priests, and they are, they're, they're holy people. They're, they're, they're anointed and appointed by God's spirit to be those people of God in the community. But in the New Testament, we all have that same position. And, and, and that is not to take holy men and women and bring them down to our level so that we're all puny, so that we're all just average, ordinary people. It's actually to take you and me, the average, ordinary people, and to say, you, you are a man of God. You are a woman. It's to elevate us and to make us go, me? Are you sure? Ooh, if that's true, I better dot, 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 right? And, and it, it lifts us because we tend to live out of our identity. If I think I'm a nobody, if I think I'm a loser, a sinner, I tend to live out of that. If I, if I think, oh man, I have a calling and a purpose and I have important things and you know that, I tend to live out of that. So Peter says, you're not like that. You are chosen people. You're royal priests. You're a holy nation, God's very own possession. You're loved. You're chosen. You're special. You are privileged beyond your wildest imaginations. And that's not just for you. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God who called you out of darkness 
into his wonderful light. When you believe that about yourself, you start to live like it. And uh, throughout church history, there have been these awakenings in the church where people got a hold of the fact that average, ordinary Christians are not ordinary. That they are supernatural, that they're called to be missionaries in their, their culture and in their day. Uh, just a couple verses later, the, the message paraphrases verse 12 like this, says, live an exemplary life among the natives, that is among the people in your culture, so that their at your actions will refute their prejudices. Then they will be won over to God's side and be there to join the celebration when he arises. So we learned this last week, that, that as we live for Christ, people will criticize us, they will slander us, but we will silence their slander, not by telling them off, <laughs> but by living the right way, that our behavior will silence people's criticisms, will, will change their minds about their prejudices, and it will sway their hearts, and they will come to know Christ. So our lives, church, your life, my life, we are displays of the gospel. We not only declare the gospel, we display it with our lives. And actually, when we're displaying it with our lives, when our actions are displaying the gospel, it makes the message that we share authentic. Doesn't it? I mean, you know this. When somebody tells you, you should, you should, you should, you know, you should put on your seatbelt, you should put on your seatbelt, you should put on, and then they never put on their seatbelt? Right? What do we say? Eh. They must not mean it, must not be a big deal, must not be important. It's inauthentic. So our actions say stuff before our words do, and they either authenticate our message or deauthenticate it. Uh, and uh, it's a beautiful thing when, when we start to realize that, and this is what I think Peter wants us to know, that opposition, in, in Peter's day there was a lot of opposition, he's telling these Christians, the incredible opposition you're facing, if you'll reframe it, you'll see that it's an incredible opportunity to show off the goodness of God, to show off uh, the gospel of Jesus, to show the difference that God makes. In fact, darkness is what makes lights show up all the brighter, isn't it? Uh, in this room, we have some light. <laughs> if you were to shine a light where you are right now, it wouldn't shine that brightly. But if we turned off all the lights and then you shone a light, it'd be, whoa. And so we need to reframe the reality that we live in a dark world and that we do face opposition and say, hey, that's opportunity for you and me to, to show the love, the goodness, the gospel of God. And that actually worked in the early church. Their sacrificial love, their service, they're laying down their lives, they're, they're, they're living out the gospel. They were just a little community, but they lived that out amongst a hostile and prejudiced world against them. And as they lived it, it turned the hearts of people around them. Not just one person, but person after person until there was dozens, until there was hundreds, until there was thousands, until there was millions. They turned the known world upside down down. It worked in the early church, and it still works today. And so God's called all of us, whether we like it or not, or whether we know it or not. Every Christian is a walking advertisement for Christianity. By his life, he or she either commends it to others or makes them think less of it. The strongest missionary force in the world is a Christian life. And Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 that God committed to us the message of reconciliation and that we are God's ambassadors. We're ambassadors. We're those who, who, who represent God to this world. Uh, and I was actually thinking this week about, I've uh, traveled to some countries where um, the, the holy men really stand out in the culture. I don't know if you've ever been to these countries where uh, the, the uh, pastors or the holy people of the culture, the monks and so on, they wear different clothes. They, 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 you know, and so, boy, you can pick out, in fact, they have special, uh, when, you, you know, there's handicap signs, they actually have monk signs, right, with the handicap sign, you ever go to, it's quite striking, and, and everywhere a monk goes, everybody notices, everybody says, ooh, ooh, there's, now, and, and here's what struck me about, as I was reflecting on it this week, when you see a monk walking around in their monk's garb, you know, they don't just represent themselves, they represent something else, right, and here's the deal, you and I, we, as we go through our lives, as we go into our homes, into our workplaces, into our schools, wherever we go, we represent, we're ambassadors uh, of the goodness of God. 
And so Peter shows us how to show off the goodness of God. And we, we saw this last week. These are some of the things that come up again and again through the rest of, of 1 Peter. We have a thriving soul. So our circumstances aren't always great. We go through the same kind of things everybody else does. But when people look at us, they see a hope. They see a freedom. They see God's strength in the midst of our trials. There's a righteousness to our lives that, that shines in the darkness. Um, and, 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 and although it sort of sometimes irritates people who are in the darkness, it also attracts them at the same time. Isn't that an interesting thing? I remember when I was in high school, I was uh, trying to live for Christ with all my might. And I mean all my might. And I didn't always do it super wisely, but I was fired up. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I'd get made fun of and so on. And, and three of, uh, two of my buddies, we were a group of three, we went around trying to live for Jesus all the time, and they nicknamed us the Righteous Brothers. Isn't that nice? Yeah. And uh, it wasn't really a, a term of endearment, let me just tell you. Um, and so there was a lot of, you know, joking and criticism and whatever. And, and uh, I remember one time I was getting real down about that. People make fun of us and, and this stuff. And, uh, but I, I was doing okay. And then my two buddies um, uh, that, that I was sort of connected to, they both kind of turned on me in this one particular day and just said, yeah, you know what, they're right and you, you're, you're not all you say you are and these kind of things. And by the way, a lot of the criticisms were true, okay, just saying, like I didn't have it all together uh, by any stretch. And so I felt totally alone at this particular time and I was just having a rough day and, and you know, I'm trying to live for Jesus, not doing it well and I'm listening to these criticisms and feeling like nobody's on my side. And this one guy, his name was Rob, we call him Robbie, Robbie walked up to me, and Robbie was a, a ringleader in the critics group, okay? He was, like, loud and fun and crazy and liked to mock people who lived full on for Jesus. And, uh, but Robbie, this day, I think he saw that I was down because he pulled me aside, or maybe it was just God speaking to him, I don't know, but he pulled me aside, and he said, Dan, probably said Danny, you know, it was Robbie talking to Danny, right? He says, Danny, uh, you know, I know we joke a lot and we make fun of you a lot and all that stuff. And he says, but you need to know something. We actually respect the way you live. And then he looked at me, and he said, you know, I really wish I could be like you. Man, I'll never forget those words. I'll never forget that. So, so there's, that's, that's part of this living. In fact, Robbie today, I have him on Facebook. He's living full on for Jesus. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So, I was, man, I was thankful for that. Okay. Wow. Getting off track here. So uh, live a righteous life. And then then we, we offer this submitted service. So in other words, uh, it get, it, and, and these kind of progress, these four things. So uh, it gets pretty radical. We say, I'm free. I've been given this tremendous privilege and power in God. And yet I use my freedom. I use the power. I use the privilege instead of to lord it over people and tell them I'm better than them. We use it to serve. We use our freedom to come underneath people, to actually become servants of people. We use our freedom to enslave ourselves, to bless others, to love others, um, to surrender our preferences to others. That rather than being proud, we're humble. And then, of course, we do this crazy radical thing that followers of Jesus do. We bless when we're mistreated. And uh, that's maybe the most controversial and difficult of the teachings of Jesus. But when, it, when we live that out well, we show off the goodness of God. We show off his grace. Okay, so today we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 3. And we've been learning these things. We're going to see how they apply in some new context. We, we learned last week how they'd apply to the way we relate to the government, the governing authorities over us, police, and so on. We learned how it happens at work. That got a little harder, right? How do you live out these principles at work? Whew, that's tough. Guess what we get to learn today? Here's how you live this out in your marriage. Oh. Okay, we're going there. Yes, we are. And then, just generally, in all of life, and, and in, in, so, so we're going to, what I've called this is different influence, let your life preach. I'm going to give you five ways in these 18 verses that you and I can let our lives preach. And the first area is in preaching to your spouse. You get to preach to your spouse. If your spouse is here right now, you can just let them know. Just, I get to preach to you, okay? And, and we're going to learn how. We're going to read these seven verses together. It might be a little different than you thought, but we'll see. Okay. In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then, even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. 
Don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They trusted God and accepted the authority of their husbands. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband Abraham and called him her master. I put that verse on my fridge. <laughs> Does not work out, guys. I'm just saying. Didn't work. <laughs> I can't read that verse without just thinking, wow, wow. Okay. You... <laughs> You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. Verse 7. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. So let's talk about how we preach to our spouses and uh, wives. That's the first section there. Very similar verses in Galatians, Ephesians, and Colossians. And these are some tough words, and and to be clear, when we look at these words, Peter is not commanding wives to accept abuse, okay? If If abuse is a situation that you're in or someone you know is in, they need to get out. You need to get out of that situation and get help, okay? And that's really important for us to know. Um, But these words still maintain their challenge. Um, And in Peter's day, there was lots of wives who were getting saved, and their husbands were not along for the same ride. And so the question is, what do you do? Um, You know, as a wife, do you just find your husband and shake him and say, you're a rotten sinner and you need to get saved, right? Um, (laughs) Anyway, I'll just keep on going. I'm getting distracted here. (laughs) Okay. Um, So you're not called to fix your husband or to preach to him. Instead, this is what Peter's saying to these wives who get saved in that situation. Um, They said, take an attitude of submission. Place yourself willingly and cheerfully as one who serves in your marriage. Live in a way that attracts your husband to Jesus, that opens and wins their heart. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, really, in all of life, this is true. There's two ways to win a person over to your side, okay, or to win over a person. You can win over a person by literally doing that, coming over top of them, right? You can win over a person by in, in business, right? We call that stepping on others to get ahead, right? And that's one way to get ahead. Now, that's the the competitive way. I'm going to win. There's a different way to win somebody over, isn't there? The way of service, the way of Jesus. You can win somebody over by actually coming under and serving them and blessing them. Uh, And uh, uh, this is actually taught not just at at home. This is the same principle that's taught at work and various places. We use our freedom to serve. So in in this context here, a non-Christian husband in Peter's day, this is his hope, will not say to themselves, oh no, my wife got saved and now our marriage is in for trouble. Instead, a non-Christian husband would be saying, yes, now my wife is a Christian, our marriage is going to get better, right? She is going to be better to live with today because she's a follower of Jesus. Um, so, so wives, you can know this. You're, by your submission and respect, you actually build your husband's faith. And as you do that, you are the beneficiary. Now, there's this special mention to beauty in this passage that we look at. Uh, and I think these are meant to be freeing words for ladies, okay? Um, just like in that culture in that day, just like in our culture, that culture, uh, this whole idea of getting over-focused on outward beauty uh, can... Uh, bring a bondage into our lives. And so Peter says, hey, listen, your beauty is not just from outward things, it's inner things. Um, Not that the outward things are wrong, we're just not meant to be bound by them. That your beauty and your value and your confidence should not be based on the outer things. Uh, It's based on your hope in God, the peace and joy and the touch of the Holy Spirit in your life. And you know what's cool about that? Those things can increase through your lifetime. Those things will attract your husband to you, and they will become increasingly attractive as you grow in those. See, if all you have in a marriage relationship is outer beauty to attract your spouse, how many you know that's going to be a problem over time, right? Because outer beauty fades. There's no sort of getting around that whole journey. 
as much as we spend money and work at trying, right? So that Peter goes, hey, you could be free from thinking that's the only way to be in love. You could be free from that. And you can build in this other kind of beauty that God has for you. Now, uh, let's move over to husbands here, okay? Husbands, it's easy to sit and listen to these verses and go, ha, 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 right? This is pretty awesome. I love this. Man, she has a lot to work on. I knew it, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'll put those verses on my fridge or whatever, right? Um, but actually, husbands, those first verses are not for you. You don't get to use them. You just get a free pass, right? You can just skip those verses. Um, there's, and, and vice versa. And, and here's actually a real challenge in marriage, and this is what I think Peter's getting at and the other marriage passages in the New Testament are getting at. Um, right at the fall, Adam and Eve sin. Sin affected their relationship by turning it into a rivalry. And actually the curse upon the relationship was that she would have this longing for him but be striving and he would have domination over her and they, they, they wouldn't be able to figure this thing out. That instead of partnering together, they become competitors. And what Jesus does in a marriage relationship is he sets us free to have marriage the way it was intended to be, right? To be serving each other um, rather than trying to dominate over each other or get things from each other. Um, so our invitation, actually, both as husbands and wives, is to live the gospel to our spouse, okay? Um, so this is what it looks like for husbands. Husbands, be considerate. Be thoughtful of your wife, concerned about her. And, and it's, it's, it's just reality that an unspoken word or a thoughtless remark can be brutal to our wives. So we are called to understand her, recognize what upsets her, and avoid those things. Learn what pleases her and do those things. We're called to root out thoughtlessness and insensitivity and to learn tenderness. And, and just honestly, for a lot of us as husbands, we struggle to understand our wives. And a lot of times, men, we, we use these words, you know, am I supposed to read her mind? And the biblical answer is what? Yes. Yes. Exactly. And you'd say back, yeah, but that's, that's impossible. That's really hard. Exactly. It's meant, this, this is meant to be a tough challenge. Men, you like tough challenges, right? You, have, you, you thrive on something to figure out and, and conquer. And here's the deal. Young men who are dating, what do they do? Man, they work overtime to figure out what makes her happy and what makes her sad and, and to win her heart, right? And they learn all these things. They understand their girl until what? Until they've conquered, right? Until they're married. And woo, that's done. Now I can go on to other challenges. And then they go on to the work challenge or the video game challenge or the whatever other challenges are in their lives. And so, men, we are called to continue to win our wives. And that includes, that includes learning how to listen, learning how to think like she thinks, as hard as that is, okay? Um, become a student of your wife. Learn her concerns, her fears, her desires. Be curious. Ask lots of questions. And listen to all the answers. Value them. Show them honor. Love them in a way that makes them Flourish. It's kind of neat here. The example that's given uh, of a wife is Sarah. Do you know what that name means? It means princess. Treat her like a princess. Uh, it says to honor her. And actually that word for honor is, is used in 1 Peter earlier for the precious blood of Christ. That that is an honorable. That's the precious, the honored blood of Jesus. We're supposed to honor our wives in a way that treats them like they are precious. The, the way I read it this week is a husband should treat his wife like an expensive, beautiful, and fragile vase in which is a precious treasure. And love, both for husbands and wives, love is made up of a thousand little courtesies, isn't it? Sometimes we think it's just in these big moments. But really serving each other is in a thousand little ways when we are thoughtful and when we are kind. And then there's this fascinating little piece Add it on for, for the husbands so that your prayers will not be hindered. Isn't that an interesting thing to say? Like, what is that? Hey, here's what I think he's saying. A lack of respect for your wife, men, lack of respect for our wives, men, 
will put a barrier between us and God. And you say, well, why would that be? And I don't know exactly. Peter doesn't say. There's lots of suggestions that I've read over these last few weeks as I studied this. Uh, one of them really resonated with me. I have a daughter. If somebody treated my daughter improperly, if they talked to her harshly or treated her meanly, how many of you know how I would respond? Right? I'd be some angry. I'd be letting that young man know where my shotgun was. Right? Just saying. <laughs> I'd be like, hey. Right? So if that young man who treated my daughter improperly came up to me and started asking me for favors, right, asking me for stuff, well, like, not likely. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> Just getting a little mad there. Okay. Here's the deal, guys. You are married to one of God's daughters, right? So we are called to not treat her harshly. We're called to love and value our wives, to put her desires above our own, to treat her with respect and gentleness. And when we do this right, husbands and wives, husbands and wives, when we do this right, it is such a, a wonderful and a beautiful thing. And it reflects, it displays the goodness of God to our world. Because our world looks at the way we think about marriage, and they're like, are you kidding me? That's archaic. That's disgusting. I can't believe you still use those words of submission. Right? And we just go, oh, if you only knew. Take a look at what it can be like. Look how Matt Chandler puts this. A husband sacrificially loving his wife and a wife submitted to her godly husband creates a relationship that the world would never look at and say how disgusting and archaic. A lot of people who say they are turned off by the Christian teaching on marriage are attracted by the Christian marriages they see. Okay? When we live this. So guess what? Marriage is a chance for you and me to, to, to preach to our spouse with our love, our example, our submission, our sacrificial service. It's also a chance to preach to the world. Okay, so let's keep going. Verse 8 says, Finally, all of you should be of one mind, sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters, be tenderhearted, and keep a humble attitude. And, and he says, all of you, because, of course, just like uh, in our day, in Peter's day, not everybody there was married, right? And so he can sense, like some people are checking out, right? They're going, oh, this part's not for me. I can skip. Uh, I don't need to think about this, right? And so Peter goes, hey, hang on. All these principles we've been talking about, the way you serve, the way you love, the way you relate to your government, the way you relate to your workplace, now the way you relate to your spouse. This is, this, these principles hold across all of life, across all of our relationships. And, and I, I'd call this one, I'd just say, you, you, you get to preach with your attitude. Your attitude. Be of one mind, sympathize with others, love each other as brothers and sisters, be tender-hearted, and then, I love that, keep a humble attitude. See, when you're privileged... When you know that you know something that, that, that set you free and could set somebody else free, the temptation is to kind of live a little bit like that, right? You say, I, I got it all figured out. I'm going to help those poor people out there who don't know, right? And it can come across holier than thou. It can come across like, like you're, you're better than somebody else. And so the spirit with which we share the goodness of God with the world is, is like one beggar showing another beggar where to find bread. We just go, this has helped me so much. I think this could help you. Here's, I would like to serve. I would like to come under and bless, not stand over. Okay? So that's, that's the, that we get to preach with our attitude. Um, and and I, I, again, I just, I long for the day, and I think it's, it's, it happens, you know, and I just think it could be increasingly true, that the church of Jesus around the world would be known for this kind of, for, for verse 8 kind of attitude, right? Being of one mind, sympathizing, being tender-hearted, having a humble attitude. Okay, we'll keep going. Verse 9. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will bless you for it. Preach with the way you respond to hurts. And this sounds so good on paper. It sounds so good in the teaching of Jesus. It sounds so good in a sermon. It feels so hard when you have to live this out. We talked about this last week, right? We, we've all been mistreated. And when you're going through being mistreated and somebody hurting you, the last thing in the world you want to do is love them back, bless them back. 
And yet this is the way of Jesus, and it's the impossible path of Jesus. It's the path that, that, that only God can give us the grace to do. Um, but I'll tell you, it, it shouts volumes about the goodness of God and the grace of God. And Jesus taught this. This is actually echoes, this verse echoes the Sermon on the Mount. It echoes lots of other scriptures. Paul taught it in Romans 12. Um, I, I think it's kind of neat that the context of verse 9 here where it says, don't repay evil for evil. It, just before that, he said, love your brothers and sisters. It, it's kind of interesting that uh, in the midst of the church, sometimes we get this idea in our heads that, yeah, people will mistreat me out there in the world. Yeah, yeah, okay. Maybe a stranger will mistreat me. But my own brother or sister in Christ, that could never happen. Right? <laughs> How many have been in church very long? Right? <laughs> no, of course, it happens everywhere, including in the church. And you and I have probably all met dozens of people who were followers of Christ at one time or other in their lives. And they experienced mistreatment in the church. And that was just too much for them. They just kind of went, no, no, no. That could never be. And yet God calls us, even in the church, even with brothers and sisters in Christ, to learn how to repay good when we are mistreated or done wrong. Okay, so we preach to our spouse. We preach with our attitude. We preach with the way we respond to hurts. The next one is we preach with what I call your happy, holy life. <laughs> it says in the end of verse 9, this is what God has called you to do. He will bless you for it. God will bless you when you repay good for evil. And so let's keep reading verse 10. He's quoting from Psalm 34. For the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek for peace, search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their prayers. Interesting. Remember, we just talked about that for husbands, the way they treat their wives. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what's right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. So you see that? He said, as you return good for evil, God will bless you for it. Then he says, if you want to enjoy life, by the way, by the way, <laughs> it is good to want to enjoy life and have many Happy days. You know, sometimes in the church world, we, we sort of go around saying, you're going to suffer. It's going to be really hard. So just don't expect to have any happy days. But you'll get through it, right? Don't, don't want to enjoy life. Just sacrifice. Be a Christian. No. <laughs> when, when we say God will bless you, we are not just talking about heaven. We are to look forward to heaven, to that day. And we will go through suffering in this day. But there is also an invitation to experience the blessing of God and the enjoyment of the good life God gives us in this life. You know, sometimes people will say, you know, oh, are you one of those prosperity preachers? Do you know what I'd like to say back to that? Actually, I'm a Bible preacher. And when the Bible preaches prosperity, that God wants to bless you, then I'm going to preach the Bible. And I love how 1 Peter brings both of these realities together. Yes, you're going to suffer. Yes, you're going to be mistreated. Yes, there's going to be persecution. And yes, as you behave in the right ways and live for God in those ways, there is rewards and blessings for that here and now and in the life to come. Yes, both and. God's blessing in your life does not necessarily mean that he's going to make every circumstance turn your way. And that you're never going to endure any other suffering. In fact, God's blessing in your life can't mean that because God clearly promises over and over again suffering in our lives. But God's blessing in our life does include the capacity to really enjoy our lives and live full and rich and blessed lives. I, I love the way Jesus addressed this. One time Peter, the guy who wrote 1 Peter, one time Peter looks at, at Jesus and he says, Jesus, we've given up everything to follow you. Like, you asked us to give up stuff to follow you. We gave up everything to follow you. And here's what Jesus' answer is. He says, and I assure you, yes, and I assure you that everyone who's given up house or brothers or sisters or mother, father, children, property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in 
return a hundred times as many houses and brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property, along with persecution. Do you see? It's a both and. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. So uh, this is the invitation to walk in the paths of God and to see the blessing of God in our lives as we walk in the path of God, along with, along with the suffering and the difficulty and the persecution that we face. So uh, we get to preach with our, what do I call it? Happy, holy life. Okay. And then here's the last piece in verses 15 and 16. Now add words. But of course we do that with gentleness and respect. Here's how it reads. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way, keeping your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. So you're going to keep Jesus as Lord of your life? You're going to keep your conscience clear? Do you know how to keep your conscience clear? The way to keep our conscience clear is when we blow it, we, come, we go straight to God and we say, God, forgive me and help me walk a new path. You know, if we have things in our lives that we're sort of sloughing on that we know, we're like, yeah, I know that doesn't honor God. I know that doesn't please God. But I'm just going to hide that in the background and I'm just going to live that way anyway. And, and when I pray, I just won't bring it up and I hope God won't bring it up and we'll just leave that there. Then we have what we would call a guilty conscience. And this is just what I find in my own life. When I have opportunities to share God's love with my kids or with my friends or, or with a stranger, if, if my conscience isn't clear, that is, if I don't feel connected to God in my life, if I feel like there's some of those hidden things, and sometimes that's reality, then when I'm sharing the love of God with somebody else, it feels inauthentic to me. Does that make sense? But when I know I'm right with God, when I know that I've, I've brought my life before God, asked him for forgiveness, and said, God, help me walk in your path. It doesn't mean I'm living perfect, but it just means I don't have any hidden junk that I'm trying to say, you know, I know this doesn't honor God, but I, I'm doing it anyway right? Then if I know that, that, that my conscience is clear, then when I share the love of God with other people, it feels genuine, feels real. So I think that's, Peter's inviting that. And, and, and I think the other thing that Peter's saying is, hey, listen, when you live like this, when you actually live these things out that we talked about this week, when you live the things out that we talked about last week, when you live like this, your life is going to really be different. And people around you are inevitably going to notice that. It's impossible for them not to. And at some point or other, they're going to say, hey, hey, what's the deal with you anyway? Right? What's up with this and this and this and this that's different about your life? And it's in that moment you go, oh, man, this is a God moment. This is an opportunity. I want to be ready in this moment to tell somebody about God's work in my life, about God's love, about the reason for the hope that I have. And I want to make sure I do that with a, a spirit, not of uh, uh, arrogance or lording it over somebody, but with a gentleness, with a boldness, but with a gentleness and a respect. Um, so let's finish this passage, verses 17 and 18. Remember, it's better to suffer for doing good, if that is what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He modeled this. He lived this. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. And here's what I think is implied in this. And so now you get to follow in his steps, like he said just a chapter before. Now you get to suffer, you get to serve, you get to love. And by God's grace, God will use you as an instrument in his hands to bring other people to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. You're going to suffer physical things too, but in the midst of it all, God will renew you. God will strengthen you. 